The Minister of State for Health and Social Welfare, Dr. Tunji Lausa, during an interview at the Ikiti State Television on the theme of the 64th National Council of Health meeting, Building a Resilient and Inclusive Healthcare System for a Healthy Nigeria, disclosed the approval of the Social Action Fund by the President, Bola Metinubu. The theme of the 64th um, National Council of Health Building a resilient healthcare for health in Nigeria. Now, President Bola met Numbu. If anybody, if you know him very well and you follow his pronouncement, health is a pivotal part of his commitment to Nigeria. Of course, he has a lot of things, a lot of issues that he has to fix in the, in the country to position our country to the next, to be a very a developed nation. So, healthcare system is one area the president has a lot of interest on and is determined to fix. And that's why he, 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 he invited myself and Professor Ali Party to, uh, to superintend the healthcare ministry. And as part of what we're doing, we started with, we did diagnostic when we took over the, uh, the affairs of the ministry, what we needed to do for the country. We sat, we had a retreat with everyone at the ministry on the way forward, how we can revitalize, revamp, and build a system for a sustainable, um, in a sustainable way, where we will deliver meaningful and comprehensive healthcare to each citizen of Nigeria. That's what the president wants. President Bola Metinubu, that's what he wants, and is very determined that every single citizen of Nigeria gets a meaningful and comprehensive healthcare. Now, well, after our retreat, after our diagnostic, we came up with four pillar, pillars on what we need to do. Number one pillar is improving our health governance, which involves a lot of components. Now, holding ourselves as physician accountable, holding the health facility accountable, developing sustainable process that will ensure that there's full accountability in the healthcare system. That's the first pillar. The second pillar is improving our population outcomes. Improving our population outcomes for every citizen of the country involves revamping our health system, ensuring we have enough um, enough healthcare, uh, uh, manpower in the healthcare system, enough equipment in the hospitals. And then the third pillar is unlocking the value chain of our healthcare system, where we can begin to uh, create durable sustainable job for the people of Nigeria, for the you know, for the for our teaming population to have good job. And that's making uh, because there's building the value chain. If you go to a country like America, healthcare contributes about um, 22.3 percent of the GDP, which translates into 3.3 bill uh, 3.3 trillion dollars in spend every year. Today Healthcare as a contributor to our GDP is less than 4%. If yeah. we're able to move healthcare as a contributor to GDP to 10, 15, 20%, we will create tens of thousands of very good jobs for our citizens. And the fourth pillar is looking at healthcare not only as physical, uh, uh, physical health, but looking at healthcare as social security and, and, and national security. Dr. Alausa shared the importance of the Social Action Fund to Nigerians, says it will help improve infrastructure, stimulate local economy, and alleviate poverty, assures the sustainability of the policy. Now we're Minister of Health and Social Welfare. And I, as um, I, I earlier said um, something about the president, President Bola Maitinumbu, is very deliberate are very decisive when he wants to, when he does, uh, when he when he puts his agenda together. Most of the agenda for Nigeria, better Nigeria, to have a better Nigeria. That's why the president added social welfare. If you see.
see healthcare in itself, beyond healthcare, there's a lot of social components to healthcare. Now, you want to make people um, healthy, you have to provide some good, uh, good education for them, good environment, opportunities for them. So, as part of the social welfare agenda, we, the president wants to, beyond health, empower people in a social way. If you look at what the president has been doing in, on the humanitarian and poverty alleviation front, mm -hmm. and when it comes to social welfare, it involves multiple components, poverty alleviation, humanitarian, and now, what we're doing now, the president has just been magnanimous enough to approve a memo that was sent to him on Social Action Fund. The Social Action Fund has been tried in other countries and has been very successful. What the Social Action Fund would do is that we would, the pre we would um, give money at community level, not to individual people, uh, uh, individual now. If the community will... Um, uh, will come together as a form of cooperative or association. They decide on what program they want to do. Is it that they want to rebuild or renovate their permanent health care center or maternity or even building a community borough or improve, uh, or, or renovating a school, a classroom or a building in any school? They'll get um, some small budget, one million, two million, to do those projects. By the time and it's not a community, a collective effort at the community level. It's good when an individual person gets some money, poverty alleviation, 10,000, 20,000 naira into their pocket. But with the social action fund, it will go to a form of mini cooperatives at the community level. They will build what they want to do. Build, take, for example, they want to improve their uh, the, uh, primary cases uh, center in their, in their town. Or they want to rebuild. Um, a remodel a, um, a set of classrooms in their town. That would, beyond doing that, they will get improved facility, infrastructure, but it will stimulate local economy. That is creating, rejuvenating, and rebuilding local economy. By the time we do hundreds of, uh, uh, tens of thousands of such uh, intervention projects across the, um, across the country, you're building prosperity from the community level down to the, to the, to the national level. So it's a, a down to the top, not a form of trickle-down economy that we see that doesn't work for people, that doesn't lift people out of poverty. The Social Action Fund will lift uh, people out of poverty. And the president was, was very careful about this in, what, in, in the way, in what he wants to achieve here. So we really have to commend our president for his goodwill, his magnanimity in thinking about the poor, in wanting to lift millions, tens of millions of people out of poverty. Thank right you. now, your concern uh, here is very tenable, but it is about credibility. The, uh, the person of this president, President Bola Mechinumbu, he thinks years out. Whatever he does, it's about sustainability. He has done it in Lagos State. For me, this is like deja vu to me. When President Bola Chinubu took over the reins of affairs in Lagos State about 20-something um, years ago, he met the state in tatters. Healthcare was, not, was probably not existent. Education was very poor. The garbage all over the street. For the first one year, he said, we will put an economic plan together that will be sustainable. So people talk, oh, you're slow. You know, people, uh, people who just want, it's like knee-jerk response. Mm -hmm. Get in there, immediacy. get the immediacy, girl, what are you doing? He laid down solid, futuristic, economic, economy and so economic plan that is sustainable. And that's what we're seeing in Lagos today. It, the, uh, the, the, the development mm. uh, that was with the, the continuous geometric development that we're seeing in Lagos today just didn't happen by chance. It happened. It was when this president was governor of Lagos State. He laid that, and we're seeing the sustainability decades into the future. This is what the president is going to do with Nigeria. He, it's not somebody, he doesn't look at things from a short gun approach. 
is not is not tunnel, uh, is not a tunnel president. He looks into has a broad view of what he wants to do for the country. So I can assure you, knowing what this president has done in the past and his commitment and his plans for Nigeria, all the policies that he's putting together will be sustainable, durable into the future. President Balatino administration will make a difference in reversing medical tourism, in improving our health care system, in strengthening all the facets of our health care system into the future so that each and every citizen of Nigeria will have a meaningful, comprehensive health care. Now, it's just not um, saying that, oh, I just make promises. Now, I'll tell you the president made categorical statement, I will fix the health care system. He made it before, while he was uh, planning his campaign, um, and this fixing the health care system, system is, part, is a huge part of his manifesto. And if you know the president, President Bola Amechibundu, he does not make empty promises. When he says something, he means it, and he puts all his God-given will behind it. The, the president started well, he went, sought out, and gave myself and Professor Ali Party, brought us from the diaspora to come and work for him and fix the healthcare system for Nigeria. And we've started and we're determined to do that. We've put solid policies in place. I, t I just told you about the four pillars we've laid together. Yeah. We're beginning to see some results, but we have a long way to go. We're building it from ground up. A medical tourism will be a thing of the past in the, in the near future. We will strengthen, improve our health care system. We, we will work with all our sub-national gov uh, sub gov uh, government. We're talking with the governors now. We've had meetings with them. Uh, uh, the governor for them, we've had meetings with them. We're working collaborative to, uh, collaboratively, to, collaboratively together. And that you could see that in the team of our 64th mm -hmm. National Council on Health Meeting, building a resilient health care system for a healthy Nigeria, the so-called JAPA syndrome. <laughs> and you rightly elucidated it, the, you, like you, the way you've asked the question, you've asked, uh, you've asked the question in a very, very um, inclusive manner. And I'll be happy to break every component down to you. The JAPA syndrome, you said, I'm a doctor. And I tell people, I feel the doctors, people going out. It's not salary. It's the, the bigger part of why people migrate out to other developed countries to work. About 30%, the reason is I'm not making enough money. And if everybody wants to work in their country, more so, most health provide, providers. People went to school to be doctors, pharmacists, nurses, medical laboratory science to be a medical laboratory scientist. It's the autism in them that pushed them, that, that pushed them to that pathway to serve humanity. It's not because they didn't take, the, they didn't decide to go to that pathway because, oh, they want to make the most money. So, but now, they, they're done with school, they're working, they don't have enough infrastructures at the hospital, equipment to, to, to help them care for their patients. It leads to frustration. I know the way they feel. That's one part of it. Now, we have the problem now. This is the problem that it, it just didn't happen now. It's gone on for so long. President Bola Tinubu has, has inherited that liability. And the President Bola Tinubu will say, please, I'm the president now. Mm. Don't pity me. I asked for the job. I know I'm inheriting this liability. And I'm going to fix it. That's what leadership is all about. Leadership, beginning the solution to any problem is to find, to identify the problem. And once you've identified the problem, then you know the problem you're going to fix. Now, with this JAPA syndrome, human resource for health, when you have, we have inadequate um, manpower in the healthcare sector. So, what are we doing as a government? as a health ministry who is superintending over this problem. Number one thing, people are living, it's within their right to live. 
it's a free world, you can't stop them. But we have a population of 220 million people. We are not leveraging the advantage of our population. The best thing we're going to do, we need to immediately increase production. We've quickly identified, we quickly met at the ministry, we have several solutions. Number one solution, we have mandated the registrars and the CEO of the pertinent regulatory body. We are doubling the admission of students that we're admitting in the next academic year. To medical school, to dental school, nursing school, pharmacy school, and all other allied I care uh, training program. So let me give you, let me be a bit granular about this. Nigeria produces about 5,000 doctors a year. The World Debt recommendation of doctor per patient is one doctor to about 600 patients. Today, we have just about 40,000 doctors in the country. If you, if you divide that out, it's like one doctor to about 7,000 patients. That's crazily bad. But we're only graduating 5,000 doctors a year. When are you going to meet that goal? With a birth rate of over 3%, and it's projected that by the year 2050, our population will be 400 million people. We will be 400 million people. So if you heard that, if you're looking at that st stark statistics ahead of you, right now you're not even close to meeting your target. So you need to aggressively increase the production of doctors, nurses, pharmacists, dentists. So I'm just using a physician as an example now, yeah. but we're doing it in every sector of our health, uh, healthcare workforce. So next year we're working would admit 5,000, uh, 10,000 students. It will go, and more medical school, we're collaborating with the Ministry of Education as well via the uh, NUC to, uh, to, uh, to approve several new uh, medical institutions. We are now single specialty universities being set up across the country. Uh, we're training uh, people in healthcare, uh, healthcare related um, Courses, medicine, nursing, pharmacies, pharmacy. So we're working with them to uh, to expedite the approval of such universities. They will have to deploy. So in the next few years, we will substantially be graduating more, more and more people across all our health uh, human resource for health uh, across all our healthcare workforce. Now, that's one part of the puzzle that we're fixing. The second big part that you alluded to is the infrastructure part, work satisfaction. I told you, we, we ground up, we're rebuilding and fixing our healthcare system. In the next few years, things will get better. In the next, things are actually beginning to get better now. A lot of changes have happened. The improved governance, things are, Nigeria will start begin to enjoy better healthcare. Now, as we build more infrastructure, improve, uh, equip our hospital more, uh, upgrade our equipment, upgrade our building, you now have a system where you have better equipment, good hospitals, uh, healthcare uh, workers in the hospital are better trained, even in culture. We, improve in, uh, we train them on culture, the way they respond to patients, yes, the way they treat patients. Patient, it's you. It's a privilege if you provide a provider, if you're a nurse, if you're a medical laboratory scientist, if you're a dentist, to serve any patient. The patient has. It's a privilege for the patient to entrust their care, which is the more your their health, which is one of which is the most important that we have as human being. Good at you go to somebody and you entrust that to that uh, uh, to that provider. So as we improve on our culture, the way we respond to patients, the way we treat our patients, the way we even treat one another. Our healthcare system will change. The entire ecosystem will change. People that are going abroad will start coming in. So in no time, we'll have abundance of healthcare workers in the country. The thing is about leadership. The president is, is giving leadership. He will continue to give leadership. And it's not going to be a short 
a short approach to thing. It's looking into the future, and this will be sustainable. I can assure you of that. I can't speak to the, I can't speak to the other uh, government, but I can speak on behalf of this government. I, the pre this president, the commitment, the determination of this president. Now, um, with healthcare worker, no doubt, nobody wants our healthcare workers to go on strike. And I'm telling you, this these are healthcare workers. It's not money that is driving it. It's some people just don't help them out. Since we've been in government now, after the president has um, has inaugurated the ministers, we in the healthcare sector, I'll talk about the healthcare sector. You have not seen any strike, and I, I can promise you, there will not be any strike going into the future. What we've done, Professor at the Professor Ali Pati and myself, as the Superintendent Minister, Professor Ali Pati being the Coordinate Minister, we have been very pro uh, proactive in our approach. We've reached out to most of the union, uh, um, uh, act unions within the ex sector. We've, we met with them. We were the ones that went to them. And they were shocked. They said, this never happened. We even tried to talk to the ministers. We write letters. Nobody's asking them. We went to them. We met with the nurses. Um, uh, union, we met we met Juresu, we met with the resident association, we met with MD Khan, and we said, listen, give us time, your uh, your uh, welfare will be a priority, and there's, and it's just not, it's, uh, you have to be honest, this is about honest conversation. Mm -hmm. It's, the in the entire welfare package is beyond the Ministry of Health alone. It's, it's, it, it resides into labor and productivity, and there's a there's another organization, so-called Wages Commission, that put all these wages together. And then in the last d uh, several years, even decades, a lot of promises have been made, a lot of um, uh, 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 policies have made, salaries uh, uh, increase or not. We, and in, in, a, in, in, in a way, I won't say in a way that doesn't follow the lay-down process, with the lay-down process. So there are a lot of multiple components. But now, the president has directed the Wage and Salary commi uh, Commission to work with in reconciling everything. There's a committee meeting now. So they will look into everything in a full microcosm and now decide what our bucket of things to be put together. So that's being done. But we are healthcare um, workers in the workforce, all the commitments, the promises the government have made to them are being met. And as we hear about some of the unmet commitments, we're working with other MDAs to ensure those commitments are met. So going into the future, we would have we will continue to have a stabilized healthcare workforce where there's no agitation. We we will listen to them. And as they're coming to us, as they're coming to us with their excuses, with, with their problems, with, their, uh, with the issues they think they have, and we're genuinely talking to them and addressing them, the ones that are beyond our ministry itself will, will, will tell them this, this is beyond their ministry. We're working with the other ministries to get this resolved. But trust us, we will get them resolved. The minister also disclosed plans for national health insurance system Says the president, Bola Metinobu, has mandated the ministry to have about 50 million people covered in four years. Dr. Alausa commended the efforts of the Ekiti state governor, Abayomi Oyebanji, on the improved health care service in the state, urge other state governments to emulate him. The Minister of State also shared plans of the ministry to retrain 120,000 community health workers improve their policies and procedure into a modern standard. I'll, uh, I'll tell you about the small bright spot, but what you've just alluded to, it's got universal healthcare coverage. I'll tell you, the president is so committed, President Bola Metinubu, this is his passion, this is his baby, he's so committed to expanding healthcare coverage to tens of millions of Nigeria. Now, Today, we have less than 10 million people covered. The president has mandated that in the next uh, 
four years, it wants about 50 million people covered mm -hmm. as part of our national health insurance uh, system. Okay. Now, there are a lot of components into the national health insurance system, it, uh, into the national health, health insurance <coughs> act that were built in it. There's something called basic health care provision for BACP. Okay. Now, that's 1% of the consolidated revenue comes to that point. Port. But that's not enough to go to service our vulnerable care uh, population and to support all our primary health care centers. And I'm going to talk about what His Excellency Governor Abiyodo uh, Abayomi Oyebanji is doing in the Kitty State, which is amazing, but I talked that about that. And with his commissioner, uh, Oye, uh, Dr. Oyebanji, feel like an yeah. amazing job they're doing here at the PhD level and also to improve the health care of Ekiti, of Ekiti people. Now, let me take you to, at the federal level, there's a basic health care provision for that's there. It's not enough. But now, we have the, the three gateways in the basic health care provision form. There's the National Health Insurance Agency Gateway, there's the National Primary Health Care Development Agency Gateway, and there's the third gateway to service the emergency medical services. Now, there. With uh, what we are now doing is what was called it's called sector-wide approach. We're trying to work with our development partners and every, to mobilize more funds that will come in a parallel way into that basic health care provision fund. So we'll have enough money to expand uh, our national health insurance to inv to, uh, to to that so, so that more people can be co can be covered. Okay. Uh, to that additional fund, additional inflow that we're going to get to a sector-wide sector, sector uh, approach that we're going to. Also, there will be more funds that will go to, into the uh, National Primary Health Care Development Agencies, which, in, which di directly now translate into various state uh, primary health care development agencies, where more funds can now be made available to the primary health care center. And if you see a lot of the primary care center, there has to also be more education. Some of these drugs are actually free. Malaria, anti-malaria drugs, it's free. We have some partners that have committed, uh, uh, Global Funds, several other funds, committed to giving us some of those uh, drugs free. Though Nigeria pays its own counterpart funding to them at the national level. But that I won't get to, that com to the complexity of that. So. But we will use more funds to strengthen a uh, primary health care, uh, uh, primary health care system, where now <coughs> people can begin to access care in a more in a more meaningful, comprehensive care. And that's why I said what a kit a kit experiment. What they've done. Now I was talking to the commissioner when I came, Doctor Yebanjipulani. They have almost hundred primary PACs that are functional in the kit now. Where people now, and the governor in his magnanimity here, has said, everybody, you have free health care if you go, if you access it to the primary health care system. So now, a kitty model is working. I commend the governor for what he's doing for the people of Ekiti. This is a model that I, we would encourage all other gov uh, gov state government to, fo to follow. As look at it now, if the, uh, the commissioner told me, Dr. Fulani told me the other day, that within three months of starting this free program in the KT, 90,000 new people have gotten into the program. So they're going to these PACs, getting, if you have malaria, you get it for free. You get, you, if you have uh, this, you get it for free there. But guess what? It's government providing free care to the people. The permanent care center, and this is what is called sustainability. You go there, you get it for free, it's free to you. But the primary health care center is billing the government, and the government is paying them. So they have money to continue to provide care. And suddenly what you're saying, you're creating a micro-economy at each level. So it's not in the incentive of the PACs, the primary care center, to see more patients, because they're getting paid. It's free to you, but they're getting paid. That's the model we're, going to, we're, we're using to expand coverage, provide more care via a universal uh, uh, coverage that we're, we're, we're working on. That. But then, that's there. But let me not, let me, the bright spot that I need to tell you here, 
that people are not seeing. Since I've been Minister of State now, I've been privileged to do visit to meet with several medical directors, chief medical directors of our federal teaching hospitals. Those hospitals are doing an amazing job in the within the constraint. They're providing good care to, to our citizens. And now I'm commending, I've commended them privately, I've commended commended them in public, and I'm using this portal to commend the medical director of our federal uh, federal medical centers, our specialist hospitals, our national orthopedic hospitals, our neuropsychiatric hospitals, and our teaching hospitals. Now, look at some states. I asked some of the, some medical, some states, some, some FMCs in the country, ask me what they charge per night in these hospitals. Some states are charging as little as 100 naira for a night stay in your, yeah, you're shocked. Yes, some is, for FMC, BIDA charges 500 naira per night. So, and if, where, can, where do you get such care in the world? So, the federal government is already, we're already trying, we're doing that, but don't get me wrong, we need to capture more people. The FMC, the teaching hospital, the, those should be tertiary care, but the way things are skilled now, a lot, they're providing a lot of primary care, which shouldn't be, which, it shouldn't be like that. But where we try, as we work to rebuild our primary health care system, uh, our primary health care centers all across the nation, with a sector-wide approach, sector-wide uh, programming approach, we would improve infrastructures, improve healthcare workers. So when it, when people in the community know, we're here now in this community. If I know that, if I go to this PhD, I will see any time I go at 9 p.m. or 1 a.m., I will see a healthcare provider. That embodies me. It improves my confidence in a public healthcare system. That's what we're doing. We've put program in place to train 120,000 community healthcare workers. We train them and now improve the 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 uh, their policy and procedure, the the standing orders that they, they use in caring for the patient. Improve it, upgrade it to the current standard. So. Those are things we're, we're doing actively now. Speaking on organ harvesting in Nigeria, Dr. Alausa says healthcare provider found guilty will be aggressively punished by the ministry. Absolutely. I, I, I absolutely no. The government is not looking away. Organ harvesting is illegal and it should not be happening and it should never happen. The go government is not looking away. Now, that's what I told you initially when we started this uh, conversation as part of our pillars that we've put together in revamping our health care system. The first pillar, improving the governance in our health care system. Holding every single medical provider in, the country, in this country accountable. Holding the health care facility accountable. As I know there's been public outcry of things, people going to the hospital and it, are they are going to be illegally harvested. Some of those might not be true, but some are true. The ones that are uh, the ones that are true are being will be are being investigated by the police, and every um, healthcare provider involved will be completely sanctioned. Their license will, will be will be suspended after full investigation. Once it's, it's found to be true, they will, they will be disbarred to, as being providers. Then they will face the consequence of the law. The healthcare uh, facility where such illegal organ harvesting happened would also be disciplined. So once you start enforcing, start making people accountable, this will stop. It, it's when you create an environment of impunity where people think they can do anything and get away with it. This is what you get. So we would, we would aggressively punish providers and facilities involved in organ harvesting. It is illegal. It is unhumane and should, never, should not be happening and should never be happening. Honestly, this should not be happening. This is something I'm very passionate about. I feel sad. It's very unfair. It is unhumane 
for me or you or anyone as a person to go seek health care and you got prescribed medication and you end up buying that mes medication with your money and that medication now turn that, uh, uh, turning around to get, cause more problem to you than the problem than the ailment you've gone to see the doctor yeah. for. The level of counterfeiting in in a country is high, but it's a collective responsibility. We can't put it on our back alone. The, we have to have to talk to the unscrupulous citizen of this country going to do this to our country. It is not fair. You're killing our people. This is not fair. The importance of those medications. Now, they also come in. We also have to talk to our customs. These medications come to our border. But, uh, now that today, look at all the medications in the country. The ones now that certify, they are medication that meets national and international standards. Now, now that does a lot of enforcement, but now that cannot police our borders. So it's a mortar agency thing to get this thing done. And I'm appealing to uh, uh, the citizens of the country that go that, that go to uh, that go abroad, go to countries and bring imported substandard imported medication to our country to stop it. It's not that you can you can make money doing legitimate things. Cutting corners, going out to bring counterfeit drug, adulterated drug into the country, these drugs are killing our people. Please stop it. It's not fair. You're destroying our country. But NAVDAC, I'll tell you, the enforcement part of NAVDAC, they're doing their work. They can do more. And I've had this conversation with the uh, Director General of NAVDAC. We have to deploy more technology to cause in form of surveillance. We will work on that because this, uh, this global positioning system, GPS technology, is easily uh, readily and very cheap. It's available now. One of the ideas I've proposed to her is that, okay, we will take this fight to the pharmacy level. This is what we'll do. The drugs that you've sanctioned, that you've vetted, that you've given licenses to, even via people producing drugs in the country, or imported drugs. Every drug, it's international standard requirement as a lot number. So what you need to do, where to use technology, in my own thought process, that you feed that lot number into a cloud-based system. And you and now, as part of our own way to curtail the, this menace of counterfeit drug, we, it, we, would, it, we would mandate every drug manufacturer, every drug importer, to put barcode on the labeling of the drugs. So once we have that barcode and the lot number is linked to that barcode, you can go to your pharmacy network in the next door here, you buy a drug. And say so you pull it up, you use your phone, you put it, check the barcode, it. scan it, and it'll tell you now that's certified. And if that barcode doesn't, if it tells you and nothing comes up, no, it is not now that it's fake. So now once you once you get to that level, even pharmacy, pharma, uh, pharmacies across the country will be dis disincentivized. To, because they are stocking this drug unaware. Because they don't check the, they don't do analysis by equivalent analysis on the drugs they buy. They, they just, they go to their wholesaler, get this drug, stuck in their shelves. They're not magicians, they, will know, they won't know. But once they know that, oh, I got this lot from this company, they go back. Your drug that you sold to me with the preemptive, with the presumption that it was NAVDA certified, wasn't NAVDA certified. They will start beginning to go to wholesalers, that, was, that that are market that are selling number certified drugs to them. So in that way, you slowly create a disincentive mechanism that will eliminate this culture of drug. I've discussed that with the NAVDA director general. This is easy. These are cheap technologies to use, and 
we that's one of the things we will work on into the future. We have to use technology to fight. You can't you can plead as I've pleaded to non productive Nigerians that are importing these counterfeited drugs, that the drugs that are killing our people, but then I can't uh, if they want to uh, continue to be bad, you can't change that. But what can the system do? What does the country the country owes it to the people to use every available uh, opportunity, every available way to tackle their illegal activities. Comfort Olayinka, Eco Hot TV.